Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This week, Krista May, an Australian travel, lifestyle, commercial and landscape photographer currently based in New Zealand, talks to me about how she decided to move there to set up her business. She wears many hats in the creative industry. She may be your go-to for weddings, elopements, brand collaborations, product photography, commercial and tourism related projects and campaigns. Most of all, she spends every waking minute exploring this beautiful planet with a camera in hand. Adventure travel photography is her passion and that really shows in her work. We discuss how she set up business in New Zealand's beautiful South Island, the moment she knew she wanted to become a full-time photographer, and where she sees the photography community heading. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Krista. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Hi, Grant. Thanks for having me. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really good. Really good. It's a nice sunny day here in um, Sydney, and... Uh, I believe it's a bit cold over there where you are in uh, in New Zealand. Why don't you start with telling us where you are and why you're there? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Queenstown in New Zealand in the South Island. It is currently two degrees, <laughs> which is a bit chilly, but uh, the sun's out, so it's okay. And um, I basically moved here for the landscape <laughs> and the mountains. And um, yeah, after living in Canada for a few years, I went back to Oz for a few months, but I just... I just miss being around big mountains. And so I just thought where was the closest place I could go and kind of set up camp in New Zealand <laughs> looked pretty Fair good. Because the Oscar think, wasn't going to do it for you. Yeah, I don't know. You always want what you can't have, right? So I was like, oh, the, the further away, the better. But I do miss Australia. But yeah, the mountains here are just just beautiful. So now, yeah, I've been here three years and I love it. It's definitely my, my home away from home. Fantastic. I certainly can't blame you. The landscapes there are uh, are absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, I'm I'm still yet to get down to the South Island, but uh, it's very high on the list. Very, very high on the list. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you got started in photography and landscape photography in particular? Cool. Yeah. Um, I actually went to uni for photography. Um, Cool. Straight out from school. I was actually like away in Cambodia, like volunteering at an orphanage with my friend for a month. And my mum rang me halfway through and she was like, okay, you've just graduated, you're away. You either need to find a full-time job when you get back or apply for uni. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I panicked a bit and I always loved animals and photography. And so like my first preference was actually a Bachelor of Science to do marine biology. And oh. my second preference was photography. <laughs> And then I got home from my trip and I was meant to like, everything was like put in. And then last minute, I just, I don't know why I just changed my major. I changed them. Like I switched to my first preference being photography and my second being a bachelor of science. Mm. And I'm not sure why I feel like there's just something, something in me being like, Oh, I feel like you'll enjoy this more and maybe I can help animals in the, in the future. And I'm glad I did. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah. Like, and then. So were you were you doing photography in any way before you started uni or was it just something that you wanted to do but never really had the opportunity? Um, yeah, I've been taking photos pretty much my whole life. My mum said she gave me like a little shooting point when I was really long, young. She said about eight, I would just like take this right. camera around and just like do shooting points and take photos all the time. And I, I can't remember that as much. Um, but I do remember buying my first secondhand camera from a, a from cash converters <laughs> when I was about 14. And wow. um, yeah, because I just started working. My mum was like, oh, well, you know, you've got a job now. You can buy a camera. And I was like, oh, yeah, I could. And then I would just take still put it on auto, auto and take pictures of like insects and bugs around my house. And so I liked doing that. And I just thought, if I like that, maybe I like studying it. And so that kind of like led on to wanting to do the degree. Nice, nice. So talk, talk to me a bit about the education side of it. Uh, I'm always interested in how people sort of learn their craft and and so on. So do you think that gave you a really good technical grounding or is it more a creative grounding? What 
what did you get out of that uh, process? I definitely think for me it was the technical side um, because it's a bit daunting because when you start they kind of expect you to already kind of know how to take photos and for me that wasn't the case I just liked taking photos yep. but I didn't I wasn't necessarily good and I didn't necessarily like know how and they kind of expected you to like already know that and I feel like for me it was that was a bit daunting but quickly I made friends who already knew and like being in that environment like I feel like they taught me a lot and then my lecturers were open to like obviously like helping you start from scratch and so I think the technical side was really good and then getting to use uh like the studios with like proper lighting and we mm -hmm. like we did made our own pinhole cameras and like cool. like developed our own film and stuff so like that was really cool just like getting back to the full basics and just like learning how it all works and light and everything like that and that that was cool I feel like I didn't actually find my niche until a long time after <laughs> but yeah. for that it was like super interesting and I really liked that side of it and I've still got like lifelong friends from there as well so that that was fun being around like creative people all the time is just like the nicest thing <laughs> yeah fantastic fantastic so you, you talked a bit about the the film side of things I mean I, I grew up in the film days where there wasn't any other options you've yeah. obviously grown up mostly uh in the digital age yeah. Um, I guess what was it like seeing that first development you know you put the paper in the in the developer and the fixer and so on and then you know you watch it dry and you see this yeah. image appear what was that like you know seeing that com coming from the the digital age where you can just look at the back of the camera and go didn't like it delete you know yeah it's so addicting i reckon like you just the the whole process you're just so engaged like waiting like you go out especially like when we were doing it with the pinholes like mm. you don't you, you expose it for like 10 seconds and in your mind you can kind of see like how it's going to look and then you take it back and then yeah you're just waiting for it to expose and then sometimes it doesn't expose as much as you want it or but yep. or it exposes too much and then you just want to keep doing it <laughs> and and i guess that that's the cool part just being able to take something and just like um using light and then creating yeah. an image is just yeah. mind-blowing because obviously when it's digital it does it all for you automatically but doing it in person on just like photosensitive paper is really unique yeah yeah no i, I remember the first time it, it, i developed uh film and uh, and whatever you know i was in, in high school at the time uh and we had a, a dark room and everything and and larges and all the rest of those sorts of bits of kit that you needed back in the day and uh yeah I, I just thought it was absolutely phenomenal and the the fact that you didn't know what you were going to get until you'd actually you know at least got the negative developed and then you could kind of get an idea but that that was a too small and even when you <laughs> look at it in a magnifying glass yeah you can tell if it's sharp or not but you still weren't quite sure what everything was going to look like until you Till you got it out of the uh, out out of the fixer and uh, on the on the rack drying. <laughs> yeah, and I think because it is such a long process and so much goes into it, I feel like it's really rewarding <laughs> because yeah. it takes such a long time. It takes a lot of thought, and you can't just take ten shots of the one scene. You'll you really have to plan everything out, and you're like, okay, yeah. this is yeah. the one, and then. When you realise how how important the calculations around the shutter speed and everything are. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No luck guessing. It's uh, <laughs> it's a hundred percent. Yeah, you're like okay, this is what it needs to be on. And you can bracket, but yeah. <laughs> uh, do you still shoot film? Uh no, very rarely. I've still I've still got my old uh, Minolta on on the shelf there, and I. I I think about it occasionally, but no, it's it's kind of like I also I, I've been there, done that a little bit, and so uh, part of it is also yeah, do I really want to spend the money and when when I can actually just you know <laughs> edit it in the back. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't blame yeah. you. I, I, I love the I love the utility and ease of use of uh, of digital. Personally, it's uh, it's yeah. way easier than having to faff around with film. Oh yeah, yeah. I <laughs> don't agree. really also also I don't have a dark room, so I'd have to go you know that old school route of uh, you know sending it off to get it uh, developed. I'm I probably could set one up if I was really keen, but I'm, yeah. I'm not that keen. <laughs> It is cooler if you do it yourself. Like obviously it's nice oh, yeah, the way and getting it done, but yeah, it's nice. Like I said, like doing the whole process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you do any yourself still or? 
No, I think I would love to. And I have just a disposable camera that I like take out for fun, like with friends and stuff like that. Just like yeah. the in-between moments. But yeah, I, I just am too busy shooting digitally that I just don't have time to shoot film. But I admire everyone who does. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm I'm really fascinated by some of the people that are you know developing in coffee and developing in soup and all the rest of these weird and wonderful things that they're doing. You know, it's insane. Like it, yeah, it makes you be super creative, which is cool. Absolutely, absolutely. I I admire them, uh, you know, immensely. Yep. <laughs> um, I've got a got a question about uh i guess the the motivation do you think it's important to have a goal in your photography and if so what's your goal um i think so i feel like for me i'm quite driven and i think lots of creatives are which is why we are so passionate about one thing <laughs> mm. um and for me i guess my goal is like i've been working really hard to try and work commercially in the outdoor adventure lifestyle sure. uh, sort of environment and for me the last couple of years I've been working really hard to like try and get in that industry and it's been really good and it's kind of worked out because it's amazing I feel like I get to join my passion of landscape photography mm. <laughs> with an uh, area which you can actually make a career as well so you get to do like the best of both worlds in my scenario yeah. and I guess for me, that's my main goal. And that's why I guess NFT has come involved as well. Like you get to do your passion and also make a career out of it. Hopefully get paid for it. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's the dream. <laughs> so why landscapes? What What is it about landscape and nature photography that really, you know, lights the fire for Krista? I think for me, it's the mission that it takes to get there as well like I'm super into the hiking and mm -hmm. outdoors and camping and um that sort of landscape photography and I think for me suffering <laughs> to get to a spot uh makes it that much more meaningful I like hiking for a full day sweating eight hours you know like I like kind of like pushing myself to the limit being being like okay this is tough like I'm at like my wits end really and then mm. getting to a point and then you get to the top and it's like you forget about it all you know like so the sun will be setting or something and then immediately I'll forget that I'm in so much pain or I'm sweating or whatever and I'll whip out my camera and I'll be running around like crazy because I'm just like this is this is what I want like being remote in the outdoors either by yourself or with friends and just like you're the only one experiencing experiencing that moment mm, mm. how it is like exactly then and I feel like landscape's awesome because it it's never really the same and I know we have beautiful days and they look the same but it's never really quite the same you know every sunset and every sunrise is different and so it's cool to be in a spot and capture that knowing that it'll never be like that again mm. um do you prefer photographing alone or do you prefer to be with people I actually prefer to be with people, I think. Um, I really enjoy capturing the little moments in between. And I think because I don't have many <laughs> creative friends in real life, mm -hmm. I shoot with a lot of just my friends and they, you know, they usually just like go to the camp and they'll hang out and they'll chill. And I like capturing those moments. And then I'll just be like <laughs> off by myself shooting like the surrounding moments. But I like coming back and then just hanging out with them and enjoying the moments together. I do enjoy shooting by myself as well, but I think I do prefer more with people because sometimes it's nice just getting hyped on what you see and then them being hyped and you kind of vibe off that. And that's a nice feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What about you? Do you like? Shooting? I, I very, very much uh, like getting out there with other people. Um, you know, even uh, if it's only one or two, you know, uh, mates. You know, you just say, "Hey, I'm going for a shoot tomorrow. Do you want to come?" And you know, just those impromptu things are, are, are fantastic. Um, that said, I equally like the the, the solitary. Yeah. life in terms of you know I'm really comfortable going somewhere that I've never been before and just yeah. you know wandering through that space and trying to you know 
work out what to capture and you know just spend that time inside my own head trying to work out what uh what what looks good and what doesn't you know yeah it's nice having the time without feeling pressure of anyone with you and knowing that you have no one else to rely on or anyone else to worry about it's just you in that moment and you just like okay i get to do exactly what i want to do <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um that that said you know i mean I've, I've met up with quite a few photographers and you know you tend to go and find little things and you you do tend to get into that little headspace of uh you know um oh there, there's a there's an interesting comp i'll go and do that and you know you might end up being a you know 100 yards down the beach from the people that you're with you know? <laughs> yeah and especially because especially if you're with a creative because you both get in the head spaces and That's then you're it. just like it's yeah. like television Every, everything like, blocks yeah, cool. out yeah <laughs> literally yeah but to, to be honest, I, I mean that's that's one of the reasons why I do photography is is blocking everything else out and just having that laser like focus on what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I agree, and it's nice. Like I'm the same. I don't think about anything else when I'm shooting. I'm just like so in the moment and thinking about like maybe where I'm going to shoot yes next or my next comp or just like enjoying it, not looking at my phone or yeah, yeah. you're just hundred percent in that moment which is nice well i look at my phone only because i use it as a remote yeah <laughs> yeah exactly turn off every other emails don't yeah well, there, there's nothing else going on yeah. um, mainly because once i've done the wi-fi to the uh to the camera i haven't got internet access to anything else so there are no there's nothing coming at me going hey look at me you know so there are no distractions you can just concentrate on it it's uh, mm -hmm. i i find it a really good switch off in terms of the rest of the rest of the world uh you know when i can do that you know and the reason i use my phone is largely because it's a really handy remote i can control every setting except the um you know the, the the main sort of mode switches you know but yep. everything else is uh controllable off the phone so it, it just makes it so much more convenient than uh than not i agree i use the same <laughs> i use my phone for the same reason it is super handy that's why yeah. i like shooting in the mountains as well because usually you don't have service <laughs> yeah, yeah so it's kind of <laughs> like my phone is literally my camera tool and that's all it is today which is nice yeah yeah no it's uh it, it's nice to switch off from the, the the rest of the world i think yeah um when you go into the field do you have a concept of what it is that you're after before you go um and you know i, I want to talk a little bit about the planning side of things and how you sort of structure a trip you know you obviously if you're hiking out into the back country in uh in new zealand it's you know it takes a little bit of prep you got to have the right gear you know just just to keep yourself alive yeah. uh but you know aside from that are you going in thinking okay well i want to go here because there's this particular view or lake or mountain or whatever that i'm after or or or, or are you responding to the landscape more when you uh get out there i am definitely a planner <laughs> i plan like when I do road trips, I definitely plan the main spots I want to shoot at or the main hikes I want to go on because I know there is a specific comp I want to shoot or just a specific landscape that looks beautiful to me. And I just think, oh, this would be a really beautiful spot to go and find my own comp there. Um, mm. But I definitely am a big <laughs> planner. I definitely suss out a lot of hikes before I do them. I don't do many that are just on the whim, <laughs> but I guess out of me and all my friends stuff I am the planner so I guess I do organize everything so that's why I already know what I'm going to shoot but yeah right. um it is nice going on the random ones where I haven't looked up anything and that's nice because it gets it's a it's a it's a nice surprise and for me yeah. who's organ who is quite organized it's kind of nice to be like thrown off your game a little bit and just have to think on the spot but um yeah I do I do plan a lot and I do specifically go to places uh for certain hikes or and, and or places and i do love shooting when there's when there's lakes and just certain certain viewpoints where i just know is going to be like a nice composition for either sunrise or sunset or an astro astro sure. spot yeah are you looking to try and make something that's unique or just distinctive in the genre Definitely something unique. 
Um, obviously, this is why I feel like I have a I have a style, but it's not super narrowed down because I feel like I'm always changing it to do something different and mm -hmm. um, shoot a little bit differently and think a little bit differently. Because um, if I do see a beautiful spot that people have shot at, I am going there, but not to shoot the same image, <laughs> trying to go there um, just to get a new perspective or see what I can do differently. Um, mm -hmm or going somewhere where I know people haven't shot much uh, and looking on top of maps and stuff like that, just so I can find a new place and a new style uh, specific to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How would, how would you describe your style to somebody that hasn't seen your work? I would say it is um, <laughs> definitely on the more like moody landscape uh, adventure sort of style mm -hmm. um because a lot of my things are captured on the go there's not many times where I do go to the one spot and set up my tripod and shoot from there I am very much like handheld on the go kind yeah. of moving all the time and I would say that's definitely the way I like to shoot but yeah um more, more like the moody cloudy mountaintops <laughs> Yeah, nice, nice. And how do you see that style developing? You mentioned that you know you're trying to try different things. What do you what do you do? I guess to add to that kit bag of ideas and so forth that you, you you're trying to put together. Um, for me, right now, I'm actually trying to get more into astro because mm. I feel like that is such a niche in itself, and I admire everyone who is incredible at it because they have worked so hard on perfecting their skills to be able to take these incredible photos and so for me I feel like that's the next step like wanting to shoot landscapes and mountains but also kind of push myself and learn a new skill because I do really feel like astrophotography is a separate skill just like different niches of photography you know like street photography yeah. it's a niche oh, it's, um, it's definitely got its own unique way yeah. of doing things you know and it, it, its own set of rules that don't apply sort of during the day or during yeah. sunrise sunset you know exactly and it's nice to actually be in like because that's the one time I feel like you do stay in the one spot and kind of really plan your composite and what you're going to uh shoot rather than just like kind of on the go which is so different to the style I shoot now so now it's nice to do something different um mm. in that aspect yeah how would you define success in your photography? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's why I ask it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> I feel like, oh. <laughs> Don't worry, take, take yeah. your time. It's, a, it's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to measure success by um, money and jobs, but I feel like for me, getting paid to shoot commercially um, is something I've been working really hard for. So I feel like that's something I've been striving for for a long time. So for me, that counts towards some of my success. Like I think five, e five years ago, me looking at me now would be so impressed. Mm -hmm. um, but me being in this current situation now I'm always like striving for more and yeah. um, I'm so happy with where, I, where I've gotten but it just like keeps pushing me for wanting to do more and get more jobs commercially um, but it was also success in your style like I look at my Instagram even which is like a good portfolio and I was looking at it on it last night actually and I scrolled back to my photos from 2017 and I was like wow even in just a few years I've just grown and my style has really come yeah. to and my photos are what I think now are like I'm I'm really happy with where they are and that's success you know like always seeing growth I think is a good thing yeah totally and I, th I think it's it's something that's really important as a photographer to do is to go back and measure yourself not against you know, the, the, the people that inspire you necessarily, use them to inspire you, yes, yeah. and, and help you grow. But to look back at your own work and say, okay, you know, that was where I was two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, whatever, and here I am now. And you, if you can see a, a 
very distinct difference between what you were doing, you know, three, four years ago and now, then that growth, you know, is something that you can, you know, be proud of. You know, now if they're worse, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If they're worse, mm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, do you feel like you still look back on your photos now and you're constantly doing that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I'm always looking back. I mean, even um, doing re-edits of yeah. things. I, I did one uh, earlier this year where I went back, I think it was 2014 or something, um, and it was one of my very first extra long exposures. You know, it was about, a, I think, uh, seven or eight minutes uh, exposure. It was down at Little Bay. Um, and I decided to do a re-edit of it and just see, learn, you know, what I knew about processing back in 2014 <laughs> and what I know now, vastly different, and the techniques are very different. So it was really interesting to sort of go back into one of those early, you know, there was nothing wrong with the composition. There was nothing wrong with the exposure or anything. It was, okay, what can I do with this image now? and you know then compare the two uh you know end results and see how far the processing side of things had come if nothing else you know yeah um and i'm not saying you know it was the the, the best photo in the world but it was just interesting to go dive back that far into the archive and yeah. you know pull something back and uh and and have a redo of it and for me i i think that's an important exercise to do to you know look at that difference between where you were, you know, back in the day to where you are now. Definitely. You should post it. I want to see. <laughs> I think I did. It was a few months ago, but uh, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to dig it out. I'll, I'll send you a link. If yeah, I can nice. find it. yeah. I, um, I don't know. I, I gotta, I gotta be honest. I don't know if the original uh, was posted back in the day. It might be, I'd have to, I'd have to scroll a long way back into the uh, into the Instagram archive to see whether oh, or not yeah. I I might not have even left it there because I might have gone, yeah, I'm a bit embarrassed about that one. <laughs> oh yeah, I've definitely deleted a few along the years. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. But I guess you know the, the that that growth um, for me is is one of the important things, and you know it's. it's it's also one of the things that drives me to, you know, look at my style, look at what I've done in the past and, you know, do something, do something different, do, do something experimental with it as well, you know, you know, turn, turn, turn the sky green or whatever, you know, just to see what it looks like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think the editing is one of the major things that actually changes along the years rather than like, yes, you should, I feel like your shooting style changes, but I think it is, the way you edit and the way you see things and now even like when I shoot I'll be like oh this is what I could do to it when I get home yeah you know and, and even I feel like I didn't think like that before and obviously yeah so it'd be cool like to go back to a photo where I never thought like that and actually well, I, I, I was going to ask does does how you shoot influence how you process or how you process influence how you shoot I think how I process influences how I shoot because mm. I do I am thinking about the final version when I'm taking the photo I'm yep. thinking oh I'll, I'll do this to it or I could do this to it or I think this will look good if if I did this um, and then some photos I don't think about that some photos are just like on the go where I'm like oh that's a beautiful shot just like as is um, yeah. but the ones I really plan out, I think I do already have a vision in my head of what I want it to look like. And then I'll go specifically shooting, trying to get that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how you're going to process it before you've even pressed the shutter. Yeah. But then yeah. sometimes it throws you off if you get home and you process it like you thought you wanted to, and you're just like, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's when it throws us off. a lot of those. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then you just have to go back to square one and you have to get that image out of your head and be like, okay, looking at it with fresh eyes, we're going to start again, get the idea out of your head and just do it. What feels good. Yeah. I want to talk to you a bit about uh, the, I, I guess, the lifestyle choice you're you said you're trying to get some more commercial work and you're doing that uh, part-time as I understand it. So how do you balance, you know, the rest of your life with your photography life? It is 
very hard. <laughs> I am uh, at a stage in my career where I am trying to be full-time photography and I think that's the hardest part because I also work part-time at a bungee jump company. <laughs> okay yep and um in tourism and that's really fun and that kind of helps just like pay for all my bills and expenses every sure. week that's just like solid income that I know is okay I can afford to live here that's all I need and then photography is obviously um extra and so right now I am doing it part-time and I do feel like I'm at the stage where I'm so close to hopefully being full-time commercial but um mm -hmm. I think I'm still in the bit of the hustling phase to get over the hump to leave sure, my sure. part-time job, but it's a, it's a hard one. But um, I have been trying to take specific days off because uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't had many in the last few months. So yeah, I've been trying to actually make a good work-life balance because I have been finding every day I do have spare spending time on it, which mm. is a great thing because, you know, like I'm really driven to make it work, but I also think like everyone knows like it, burnout it's a real thing and yeah, you know yeah. you need to still have time where you don't shoot and then you can just hang out and enjoy life and not be thinking about work because photography it's my love my passion and I want to get paid to do it as a career but also it's nice to just enjoy life without the camera sometimes yeah absolutely um so when when you talk about the commercial work what Talk to me a little bit about how you're structuring that in terms of, you know, what sort of work you're chasing, you know, uh, you're chasing locally, you're chasing, you know, around the, the, the country a little bit or, you know, just just how do you how do you, I guess, structure your business side of things a little bit? Yeah, I definitely try and approach um, companies and businesses locally because I do feel um, lucky to be able to, to be able to live in New Zealand and I really want to give back to that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, working with local brands uh, is high on the list and I think they also appreciate that working with, a I call myself a local now, <laughs> um, a local as well, you know, someone that like appreciates New Zealand and I think that works well. But yeah, I definitely try and reach out to companies who I admire as well. You know, I um, only work with companies who morally fit with my morals, <laughs> if okay. that makes sense. And yeah, um, yeah. definitely in the outdoor adventure lifestyle, like got a few gigs with Keen Footwear, Icebreaker, a few local yep. and companies and um, things like that. And definitely try and hit up the tourism places as well because I know um, working with them is awesome and it's so cool to be able to like capture the New Zealand landscapes in, in that aspect. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, definitely try and shoot locally first and then um, branch out to some other bigger brands elsewhere in the world. Yeah. I've, I've spoken to several photographers uh, that have either gone full-time or part-time professional. Um, and one of the things almost universally, they're, they're, they're trying to work through the struggle of uh, dealing with the brief um, and the timeframes. How do you do that? Yeah, I've been uh, quite lucky with most of mine. I, my working at the bungee jump company, they have been really good to me in the way that they understand that um, I'm not going to be there forever. And they're really, mm. they're really helping me with my business outside of that. And when I do ask, if a company gets back to me being like, oh, I need a shoot next week on the weekend and I'm working, they are yeah. very good with wanting, letting me have the weekend off or letting me change days so I can accommodate that. And so for me, that's been really lucky. And I think without that, I would have struggled the same thing with the briefs and stuff like that, because sometimes they do want it pretty ASAP. And especially if you're working with an outdoor brand, like you do usually have to go on a hike or somewhere adventurous to make that happen. It's not a quick. Yeah. So uh, you can't just pull the shoot. car up, step out of the car park and go click. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There is a little bit of admin to it. Um, and also weather <laughs> sometimes. Is yeah. Well, I'm on a sunny day and you've got a month of rain forecast. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And sometimes it works for what you're shooting and then sometimes it definitely doesn't. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think um, having my other job being really considerate of my photography business has been super helpful. And without that, yeah, I just, I wouldn't be where I am really. So mm, sure. Do you run workshops at all? Or are you just sort of doing the those sort of commercial shoots? 
I want to run workshops. That's my next goal, I would say, yeah. is running advent outdoor adventure workshops. And I have been looking into it more. Um, and it's definitely something on the agenda and something I've talked about with another photographer who I'd be really keen to do it with. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a lot of <laughs> admin that I didn't consider after talking to a few like people in New Zealand who do workshops here. Yeah. Uh, the the DOC, the Department of Conservation, they have a lot of rules, uh, which is fair enough because they have to obviously have to protect their land and whatnot. Yeah. And so I'm in the midst of trying to sort out those little niggly details and see how um, feasible it's actually going to be. But I would love to. I would. That's my next um, yeah goal. I would say is doing workshops. Mm -hmm. One, one of the key things that uh, a lot of professionals uh, or people that want to become professionals, uh, you know, they, they they struggle with is how to price their work. How do you go about that? What what do you have a process or do you uh, <laughs> stick a finger in the yeah. air and say, yeah, it'll be that? You know, I also struggle. <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the hardest thing, honestly. Even when you research, oh roughly how much does a commercial photographer charge for example at the end it always says oh but you can charge whatever you want yeah. <laughs> and that is so off-putting because I do kind of wish there was a standard rate for everything so I could just be like okay this is what I charge for weddings this is what I charge for commercial this is what I charge for tourism but it so isn't and I have struggled a long time and I feel like the what I found the easiest was actually talking to other photographers who were um, already in the industry that I want to be in and already successful <laughs> and trying to get like a bit of a vibe of them without like obviously being like tell me how much you earn <laughs> but just like talking to them and getting a gauge of like a rough ballpark of what they yeah I mean a, a good place to start is an hourly rate you know yeah. and you know make that your base rate and then if there's extras on top you know well you want you want drone photography, or right, well, that'll cost you a bit more, or you want whatever you know that that yeah. that'll that that's on over and above the the, the base rate. So that, that I mean that's that's how I sort of look at structuring my stuff at the moment is you know the, the, there's a base rate um, that I'm not willing to go below. I, I will discount that that that's the hardest part is that clients don't value photography. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they kind of say, well, all you're doing is going out and pushing a button, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. yes, and <laughs> yeah. there's this, 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 and this. And once, yeah. once you actually explain some of what's behind it, the, the, the client, you know, uh, starts to open their eyes. Doesn't necessarily mean they open their wallets, though, you know. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, do you feel like you still struggle with prices or is it? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you, like you know, you know that you know you're losing jobs because you've probably priced yourself out of them, you know. But yeah. you kind of also go, well, maybe they're not the right type of client. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's hard to it, it is hard to gauge how to price certain work, you know. But as I say, I, I usually start with that hourly, hourly rate. And the hourly rate isn't for the shoot; it's for the shoot and the processing. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, you know, it's an end-to-end -end price and, you know, that could be, you know, I could bundle that up into a daily rate or I could bundle it up into, you know, a, a package deal with a bit of a discount if it's something that, you know, I really want to do, but they haven't quite got the budget for, for what I want to do for them, you know? Yep. <clears throat> yep, I agree. I think it's a constant struggle and I think it's hard because it's the age old thing of people working for free because they want experience. And then it, once you get the experience, you want to start charging, but then there's a cycle of new photographers coming in wanting to work free. And so then the clients don't want to pay you once you're experienced and it's just a vicious cycle. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it'll ever end. And to be honest, I think it's probably been that way for a long time, unless you are well known and you know, you're doing, I mean, the, the, the guys that make the, the the biggest money are the 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 fashion guys you know that uh you know are shooting for vogue and all the rest of that sort of thing you know yeah. but, 
that, that's not me. You know? Oh no, that's not me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll stick to my mountains. <laughs> yeah, and it's not my, not my kind of photography at all. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm on the same page. <laughs> so you chose to move to New Zealand because that was where you wanted to shoot. So obviously now where you live influences how you shoot. Do you think, I mean, it influences what you shoot, obviously. Do you think that influence uh, has been good for your photography or, you know, I mean, sounds sounds like you're pretty settled there and pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think when I was finished uni in Australia, I went through a stage of what everyone does after they finish studying is kind of never wanting to shoot again because it is like it's exhausting three years of just like constantly thinking and shooting and I just wanted a break and so, so everything around my hometown wasn't really inspiring much inspiring me much and so I ended up moving to Canada not long after for a working holiday and mm-hmm. um, I was like obviously I'll take my camera <laughs> and we'll just see how it goes and with the within maybe like two weeks of getting there I just had this like new passion again for it I just because I've never seen landscapes like that before being from Australia and being from uh, Brisbane I'd never really experienced anything like that before and I'd never really uh, been to many countries outside Australia and I was just blown away Uh, (laughs) and so I think that kind of ignited something for landscapes and that's where I was first like okay this is what I love shooting because after uni I wasn't really sure what I wanted to shoot or the path I wanted to go down you know like being wedding photographer or commercial like I wasn't I didn't quite figure it out after uni and so I just started shooting for fun and landscapes is just what gave me fun and I wasn't doing any jobs I was just shooting for me and Mm. (laughs) that was the best thing and then my visa ran up after two years and the same thing I went back to Oz and it's just a little bit flat <laughs> yep. and then yeah I just came here and now I just love it and so yeah it's definitely influenced what I like shooting and I definitely go on holidays to specific places because I want to be around places that I want to shoot <laughs> yeah no can't can't say I blame you for yeah. people that don't know the area you're in Queenstown so you know yeah. how, how would you describe that to somebody that's never been it is um, surrounded by huge mountains everywhere you look, pretty much 360 degree view of mountains. And we live, Queenstown is on the third biggest lake in New Zealand. So the lake is massive. So it's just a mm-hmm. stunning blue lake because it's glacial fed glacial and water, glacial yeah. till. Yeah, exactly. So it's just this vibrant blue and surrounded by massive peaks that just go straight into the water basically fantastic (laughs) yeah (laughs) have you got a favorite spot nearby or or anywhere in the world actually doesn't have to it doesn't have to be nearby that you I, I guess when I say favorite spot somewhere that you keep getting drawn back to that you know you you've just got to shoot again and again I definitely think the Remarkables, which is the big mountain range that is right here in Queenstown, which is a ski field, but um, it's one of the only mountains that actually face north to south, which is pretty cool. Mm. Uh, One one of three, I'm pretty sure. And it's amazing. It's so beautiful. And I can see it from my, I can see it right now (laughs) from my balcony. And so I'm just always staring at it. And um, I always see it in different lights. Every time I get home, I just like want to shoot it. And even being up there, it's a new landscape being in the actual mountains. And like I've summited the very peak of it uh, with my friend a couple of years ago, which was awesome. So I've pretty much been all around up and down (laughs) shooting the whole thing, but I'm still finding new spots to shoot, which is so cool and new composites. And every time I'm like, this mountain just has so much to give. (laughs) Mm -hmm. When, when you're, out and about, I guess, uh, hiking. I, I was talking to another New Zealand photographer who likes to get into the backcountry, uh, Laren Ray, uh, <laughs> a, a little while ago. Um, he, we talked a little bit about the gear and how you pack for that sort of thing. What, what are you doing to trim down on your photography gear and what are you doing to make sure, obviously, that you your survival is uh is looked after as well 
Oh, you just carry a really heavy bag. No, (laughs) there is definitely, it depends on the hike. I think I definitely suss out how big the hike is going to be. And if it's going to be a quite extreme one, I definitely do try and take maximum two lenses Mm. uh, just to kind of cut down on that. Always a tripod, a hundred (laughs) percent. And, um, yeah, making sure I get my sleeping bag, my mat and being in New Zealand, honestly, it is like four seasons in one day especially being in mountains I'm always like puffer raincoat beanie gloves like always being prepared even in summer I'll take those sorts of things yeah Um, so yeah for the bigger ones I'll definitely maximum take two lenses but for the smaller ones I'll I'll probably take three (laughs) (laughs) just to get the full range it's just so hard Uh, so which, which I guess it depends a little bit on where you're going, but which, which two do you normally choose? What, what, what do you go to? Um, my OG used to be my 15 to 30. That used to be my baby that I took everywhere. And now I've slowly gone into the other end. And my favorite is probably my 70 to 200 at the moment. Yep. And then I'll always take that one and my 24 to 105, because I think the 24 to 105, I can still shoot Astro but I've still got that middle range of like the adventure yeah. sort of on the go yep. zoom that I need. Um, so yeah, they might, they're my go-to at the moment. Cause I, especially the zoom when you're in the mountains and you can just see the glow on the, the Alpen glow on the peaks. I just love capturing like the really fine details of that. So yeah, that's my new favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What's your most memorable experience out in uh, photography? Um, I think it would be towards the end of my time in Canada. Um, I feel that's when I really started to get (laughs) good, (laughs) I would say, and where my landscape photography was kind of hitting a point where I was like, okay, wow, I'm definitely seeing, um, a change and, like professionalism come into it as well something where I could see like oh you know like these are good enough to like be printed or or along those lines and Mm. I think the last road trip I did was through the Rockies with my friend and then we went hit all like the big hot spots of the mountains of like Moraine Lake, Maline Lake, um, Lake Louise, all those main spots where I've seen thousands of photos before. And for me, being able to capture them myself and be impressed by my own photos, mm. I think was my turning point where I was, I was like, okay, this is, this is cool to actually see the progression. And then from there is just like where it kind of headed off basically. Nice. Yeah. Have you had any horror stories? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had one where it's 100% my fault, but me and my friend did this massive hike and it was still to this day the hardest hike I've ever done. I got to a point where I didn't think I was going to finish and I've never not finished a hike. I had a bit of a mental breakdown, a bit of a crying session. Um, I was definitely at my peak of no return and I was thinking about going down and last minute I was like okay just stick it out you're three quarters of the way there like just finish it and we got to the top and then we just kind of had a break and we we were thinking about where to camp so we just kind of took our cameras left all our bags Mm -hmm. at the top and went exploring and we went like pretty far and I was already wrecked and so we got to a point where we found flat ground and me and my friend who's also a photographer was like okay we'll stay here and I was like (laughs) I was like, okay, let's leave our cameras here (laughs) and then we'll go get our bags and then come back. And he was like, okay. (laughs) And so we both just left our cameras on this ground in the middle, on the ground on the flat spot in the middle of the mountains and had to walk maybe back 15 minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes to get our bags and bring them back. And we got lost and couldn't find them for maybe like an hour and a half. We were looking for them and searching and I... (laughs) <laughs> was just I was so exhausted I wasn't making any rational decisions and I just can't yeah. believe I, w- I was like oh let's leave our cameras on the ground in the bush <laughs> and we did and was it were they in bags or was it just no no just, they were just straight just up cameras. camera on ground and so they black as well okay. and it was super hard to see and <laughs> we were we were panicking I was like this is so much gear to just leave behind and <clears throat> So yeah, we were running around like, oh, it was horrible. The feeling of thought, thought, the thought of 
nearly losing it was horrible, especially after like spending a grueling amount of time getting up there and then not being able yeah, to shoot. Yeah. Everything was just so daunting. And we finally found them. And I think I'm pretty, I think I cried because I was just <laughs> <laughs> so overwhelmed with so many emotions. And then ever since then, I'm like, I'm never leaving anything ever again. Everything is staying on my body at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's that's amazing. I mean, it, it's amazing to me making that decision. That that's just something I I, I couldn't do. It's like yeah, it, and it, it doesn't matter that there's nobody around. That that's that that wouldn't be first yeah. thing in the mind. But it's just like no, yeah. even if even if I don't have a strap for my camera, it's in my hand. It's not going yeah. anywhere. <laughs> I think my thought was like oh we'll we'll definitely sleep here tonight and no one's around so we'll definitely be back here and yeah I was just exhausted I wasn't making wow. any rational decisions and the worst part <laughs> was because it was my decision I was thinking oh god I'm gonna have to buy two new cameras <laughs> for me and my friend because it's my fault <laughs> oh wow what's the practice of photography taught you about the world don't leave your camera on top of <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, don't make silly decisions when you're dehydrated. No. <laughs> um, sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> sure. What What's the practice of photography taught you about the world? I feel like it's taught me that, and this is probably super cliche to say, but I feel like it's cliche because it's true. It is honestly mental. Like the fact that we get to enjoy this planet as is, is just mind blowing. Just mm -hmm. for free, especially being in a country. I feel so lucky being like Australian as well. Being in countries where you are super free to kind of do what you want and go where you want and shoot what you want. I'm constantly blown away that I just get to live in the mountains and shoot shoot these sorts of things and it's just it really does give you appreciation for life I just think I get to do this every single day I get to enjoy this every single day and I feel like some people in the world don't get to do that and yeah. so I think you really gotta gotta remember that sometimes especially when life seems a little bit hard which it is and it's all relative and valid but I think sometimes I feel like just knowing that you get to enjoy it is cool you know it's Planet Earth is amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so many unique places which are mind blowing that don't even look like they're real. <laughs> hey. how, how long do you take? You, you mentioned you, you're a planner. How many hours would you spend planning or days or weeks planning a shoot? Um, oh, a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think. If it's just a shoot, I definitely, definitely like a good day or, day or two. If I'm camping somewhere, if I'm going into the mountains, I'll definitely a day or two plan kind of like the gist of getting there. If there's anything I want to see along the way, <laughs> what I need when I get there, things like that. But for a road trip, like I've done a road trip around the South Island a couple of times and yeah, that took a couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I am constantly thinking of new spots and, and then it never stops. You see a new spot and then you're like, add it to the list, add it to the list. And that's why I've done three road trips now because I can't see everything on one trip. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, it's one of, one of the reasons why I bought myself a, uh, a motorhome is so that I can just pull oh. up, get out and go and take shots where, where I want, when I want, rather than having to plan a three or four hour drive to get to somewhere. <laughs> that's the and, best and find thing. accommodation and all the rest of that you know yeah what what size motorhome do you have how big uh, it's uh just for myself and my wife but um yeah it's uh it it, it doesn't arrive until november so uh, oh it's on order yeah it's on order uh, oh, ordered it last exciting. november oh, um, oh wow apparently it's uh set for the october build so hopefully it'll be being built soon <laughs> oh my god that's gonna be so amazing where's gonna be the first first place you go uh probably the south coast uh down the sapphire coast love yeah, it down see. there um i think the the first big trip though uh we're already starting we're, we're starting to plan now and you know it's probably two months before i get the the, the van 
but uh, we're already talking about doing a, a month or two down in Tassie. Yeah. You know, oh my so god! Beautiful. Sort of wandering around, parking up, doing what we want to do, and uh, yeah. Have you been to Tassie? Yeah, uh, only only ever spent a week there. Uh, did a did a part lap of it. You know, Cradle Mountain. You know, all the all the, all the, spots, the yeah. usual high spots. You know, as you as you try to cram everything into a week. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, I. I the, the reason why I've done it is because I want to take that time and have the leisure of being able to, you know, stay at a place for a couple of days so that I get the conditions that I want or, you know, and if I don't, well, I'll drive somewhere else, you know, yeah. park up there. You know? <laughs> exactly. I think motorhome is the way to go 100%. I have a camper van as well here and yeah. it's my best friend. <laughs> it's just so convenient, just like setting up shop where and when you want and just like going on your own terms like you said you guys are gonna have the best time <laughs> yeah yeah oh, i'm so looking forward to it just just can't wait but uh yeah, anyway it's uh that, that, that's in the future <laughs> yeah i'm excited to see what you get from your trip yeah same here same here um what sort of things are you doing in the field uh that might be different to others you mentioned that you do a lot of handheld shooting um, but you also take the tripod. Obviously, if you're doing astro, tripod's a, a must. But yeah. talk, talk to me a bit about your handheld shooting style and what you're doing actually in the field. Yeah, I like the... Because um, I do a, do a lot of alpine work as well and um, a little bit of mountaineering and stuff. I like doing the on-the-go natural shots, you know, the, the ones where people are walking or um, yep. things like that. And I like I like just capturing it as is. I don't like telling my friends to, oh, go back to that spot and then walk up again. I, I like just in the moment taking it. So I pretty much I have that, um, the camera clip, and I'm immediately just like, and if I don't get it, I'll kind of like wait for another spot where maybe I could get that again. But I, I like... I like it being all natural. And I think that's when I'm out shooting in the mountains, that's what it is. And that's what I like the most, you know, it's not planned, yeah, um, yeah. which is good. And then obviously um, use, I use a tripod. Yeah. For, for sunrise and sunset to get those early morning glows, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my hands yeah. aren't still enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I guess you've, you've got your shots and you come back home are you straight into processing or do you leave things to ferment for a little while before you get get into it um depends how exhausted i am but mm. if not i am pretty quick to want to put them on my laptop especially my go-to is i'll go to my favorite three and i'll edit those pretty quickly yep. uh, i think because i have the, my favorite ones are usually the ones that i've thought about the most and so i've been thinking about it for ages in my head and so i'm really excited to try and get that um get that going straight away and yep. then the rest i'll leave for ages and then i'll come back to them <laughs> so what, what are you doing in terms of processing are you trying to go for that naturalistic sort of minimal uh editing or are you right into it you know 25 layers and luminosity masks and all the rest of that sort of thing no mine's pretty natural i do like going for the natural sort of vibes but especially if you like being in the landscapes i'm going there shooting at golden owl because i want that natural look and so i am very much using lightroom for the majority of things and i only mm -hmm. use photoshop if i do you get a bit bored where I'm like, okay, I want to go extreme or, you know, test what I can do with the image. But I would say 90, 95% of the time is just basic edits. Um, yeah. Just in my room, just trying to get that natural sort of vibe or just kind of how I saw it on the day. Cause obviously shooting in raw, you do need to do those basic adjustments to get it to look. Yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta sort your contrast out if nothing yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Otherwise it's just flat and you're like, that's not what it looks like in real life. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. 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 What about you? I, I, I tend to shoot uh, somewhere between three and five exposures bracketed because I'm mostly doing sunrise, sunset, seascaping, but mostly, you know, yeah. it's a little bit different if I'm, uh, you know, in a in a forest doing a waterfall or something like that um yeah. but i still i still might bracket a bit depending on what the you know 
as you know, in a forest scene, you can uh, get quite a high dynamic range. You get some really bright highlights and really dark shadows. And yeah. I've just for me, I find that bracketing and using masking, you know, mm. I, I do everything exclusively in Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> simply because, it, you know, my, my, my uh, I guess, processing style really dictates a little bit about how I shoot and yeah. so I, I shoot knowing that I'm going to be you know using luminosity masks and whatever to yeah. <laughs> to to do what I want to do you know to and you know the the idea for me is to give that impression and feeling of what I felt while I was standing there watching the sun come up you know exactly and especially uh, for sunrise sunset you really do need to bracket otherwise you just don't get everything well, yeah you are, you either end up with blown highlights or yeah. You know, it's such grain in the shadows that it just looks disgusting. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a high ISO shooter either. You know, yeah. I, I, I tend to, uh, I will do it yeah. for certain certain things, but, you know, I, I tend to not like going much above about 800 ISO. That's, a, that's about as high as I'll go, unless I'm shooting an Astro. Oh, yeah, yeah. Different you know, game. <laughs> different game, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, but, I agree. Uh, no, it's uh, for for me. It's it, it's really about you know just managing the light. Um, one of the reasons why I did it. I mean, to, to be honest, one of the reasons why I started shooting that way was uh, sort of budgetary. Um, I looked at you know buying grad filters and all the rest of that sort of thing, and thought, well, hang on a sec. There's a way I can do that without having to spend lots of money, and I can. I I have. Three, so I have four filters, a CPL, yeah. uh, an ND8, an ND64, an ND1000. So 10 stop, yeah. you know, wow. so 10 stop, six stop and three stop. And I use them or a combination of those to get what I want. If I'm going really long, I mean, some sometimes some of the shooting that I do uh, will be no filter at all, like the... Uh, nautical twilight stuff that I do where you're doing like a seven or eight minute exposure yeah. well before the sun's come up. It's it's really dark. Mm. <laughs> There's no filters, but you've got to you've <laughs> got to have the, the shutter open just to, and I, I like that and the processing of that's very different because it's it's not about bracketing but you know it, it, it's about you know again managing the highlights and the shadows but you you've got a very different image and I, I like that because you 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 don't get a lot of opportunity to shoot like that. It's it's a very yeah. small window of time that you've got, and you never really know what you're going to get until you've you know closed the shutter and the, the things appeared on the back of the camera, and you kind of go, well, just wasted the seven minutes or. <laughs> Fantastic. That looks good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And sometimes like seven minutes is a long time when in that time. So yeah, if you do kind of don't get exactly what you want, you kind of miss the window for the next one. So it's that's like exactly oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's the challenge of that sort of shooting. So but yeah, processing wise, it's um it, it's usually uh probably about 10, 15 layers of wow. and pieces. Yeah. And depends on what I'm doing. You know, I might I might chuck a vignette, which is a couple of layers, you know. Um, because with with vignetting, I do I do that manually. Um, I don't just use a uh, a radial um yeah. uh, gradient. I actually uh brush in so I have a, a layer that is for darkening and a layer for brightening. And I basically brush in what I want lighter and what I so it's a it's a weird kind of dodging and burning. Yeah, awesome though. Yeah, but it's it's just something that it's it's a bit different. Yeah, and I feel like that's unique to your style as well, which is good. You know, not just putting like the the normal gradient on. Yeah, well, you know, as I say, it's just just something that I've I've preferred over the years. It's uh, it, it's easy to do and it. You know, okay, adds a couple of layers, but who cares? You know. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> so when um when you print your work, what are you are you printing at home or are you using a service? Um, using a service. Yeah, I did have a company in Australia on the Gold Coast I was using, but mm -hmm. now I've been here so long, I've I'm currently in the midst of making a new print store and using a local NZ company, which is good. 
and yep. then um, yeah, getting printed here. And I like being able to see it before it goes out to my customers. I hate the idea of not being able to see it myself because I want it to be perfect, obviously, yep. like everyone yep. else. Yeah, exactly. The, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they send you pictures and stuff, but I'm like, oh, it's not the same as actually seeing it in real life. So No, the, the, the screen and the print are two different things. So I, I guess in, in that, how many iterations would you go? Do you do many test prints before or are you? Yeah, I would do a few test prints before because I'll have like a certain... I won't have all my images on my print store. It's just the certain ones I want. So I'll do a few test prints of those ones and get those down pat. And then I'll know exactly how it's going to look every time when I print it. And then if I put a new one on my print store, I'll do the same thing. I'll do a few tests on either side just to see, see what it's going to look like. And then have that specific file saved for yep. that specific printer, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever hit a creative wall? Oh yeah, <laughs> big time. <laughs> I feel like it's, I feel like it's nearly impossible not to hit creative balls. I feel like sometimes you just get to a point where you feel like you don't have the energy or the drive to shoot anything. I've definitely gone through a few stages of that personally, just not wanting to take my camera out or just not finding anything super interesting. But yeah, yeah, yeah I think it doesn't last long, but um. I feel like the longer it lasts, the more you are keen to get back into it once you do find something that um, brings back that passion, I guess. Mm -hmm. I feel like for me, I'll just go, I'll try to go on a hike or something like that just to, you know, see the golden hour time and be like, okay, yeah, I want to shoot, you know, make, do something that makes me want to have my camera on me. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you kick start it? I mean, going on the hikes not a bad bad way of doing it, I guess. Is, is there anything else that you do to sort of kick start your creativity? I think definitely looking at other people's um, Instagrams and stuff like that. I would say Instagram is a great platform for inspiration. Um, I definitely follow. I'm sure same as you. So many photographers. My feed is just photographers basically, and I yep. think that helps as well. Seeing them especially people you admire getting mm. out to shoot I think that that like makes you want to push yourself as well because you're like okay they're out shooting um I, I want to be out shooting you know and or you know like if they're, if they're in New Zealand and, and they've found a cool place where I haven't seen before I'm like oh that's that's really unique like I I, I want to go shoot there or like I want to find a new spot or I think definitely using other people or other creatives can definitely help get you out yeah. of it <laughs> no, definitely what do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now the underappreciation that <laughs> clients <laughs> put on the creatives i would say is really hard i think yeah. now especially like working hard to pitch companies that i want to work for it is really disheartening when people even contact you being like, Hey, do you want to do this? And then they're like, yeah, I'll send you products. And you're like, I can't pay my bills on products. I don't want products. You need to pay me. <laughs> and I think that's. Well, that's product, products are better than exposure. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think it's still, everything takes like so much time. I, I know think what it's, you time. Mean. it's the time is the, yeah. the money thing. Yeah. I think that's the hardest thing for me. And yeah, like you said, I don't know if it's ever going to change, but We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see the future of photography going? Mm, I feel like <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know. I think that's one aspect, definitely NFTs. I think it's cool. It's a new uh, platform where like photographers can be considered artists, which I think is really cool. And I feel like it gives small creatives like myself a chance to be seen and a, and a new aspect, like we said, to like make a career or um, things like that. But um, I also think it's one of the things that you need the most because we do have phones and stuff that can take great photos. <laughs> phones are amazing, but yep. you still need a photographer. And, there's a, and I think that's where we come in handy. And I think that's like 
that's a good thing. Everyone's like, oh yeah, no, photography is dead. It's not. <laughs> I don't think like phones. Well, are photography's dead. been called dead. I think for oh. the pretty much every every year for every year, yeah. Every every year I've ever been involved in it. <laughs> I think if anything, showing that phones can take great photos, it, it's it's proven that not everyone can take a great photo. <laughs> like yes, yeah. your phone can do it, but if you if me and another random person take a photo on the same phone, mine is probably going to be better. <laughs> and I think that's where the skills and experience and the eye come into hand. And so like, yeah. I do think if anything, maybe companies are hopefully starting to see that it is important to actually use legit photographers rather than people mm. with a phone. <laughs> do you see AI as being a, a threat or a, an advantage to photographers? Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a tricky one. Because I mean, if if I was a if I was a client and I wanted my product, I could you know go to uh, you know one of the ones where you put in the words and and then you can pretty much yeah. have it generate what you want to a certain degree. You know, to a certain degree, but yeah, it is pretty spot on. I think it is a a little bit of a threat, I guess but nothing is quite like having an actual photo. And I still feel like even though they look super real, I think if they were going for the natural vibe, I think photos will still be on top, but I definitely think it is, there's going to be some competition for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm interested in seeing where it's going, but uh, for me, I still think, you know, that creative pursuit of a human you know, doing their thing as opposed to a machine, you know, running an algorithm, just, I don't, I don't think there's anything to compare, you know. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. yet, anyway. Not yet, not yet, yeah. Ask me again in 10 years. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's it. Um, what do you like to do when you're not out shooting? Um, I am pretty adventurous, <laughs> as is, so I'm really into my outdoor sports. Like, I do a lot of rock climbing, and um, I go canyoning and stuff. Being New in these Queenstown's just the adventure capital of New Zealand, so I'm just yeah, always out yeah. about. But yeah, kayaking, swimming, canyoning, rock climbing. Like, yeah, that's pretty much what I like doing. I like being outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't we all? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, it's just especially with summer coming around. I'm so excited just to spend days in the sun. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm keen for it. Anything outdoors, I'm keen. <laughs> What tips would you give to uh, an eight-year-old Krista that uh, has picked up a camera for the first time? <laughs> mm. <sighs> oh, <that. laughs> um. oh, I'm having a mind blank. <laughs> That's okay. I I would probably say don't listen to people who tell you that you're not going to make it because I feel like when you decide to go down a creative path lots of people think that you'll never find a job or you know mm -hmm. it's not a real job and all these negative thoughts that people would never say to a, a lawyer yep. um, or something in that aspect and I just think that really got to me when I was younger and pushing past that it's been hard like I'm sure with everyone else and so I'm just like yeah don't don't listen to them and I feel like if anything like it's made me be like want to prove them wrong but yeah it's still hard to get past people constantly telling you that you're never going to make it as a photographer or in the yeah. creative industry or it's saturated or blah blah you just got to stick to your guns do what you love doing and if you love doing it you make it work fantastic and great advice I think we all have inspirational and aspirational photographers. Is there anyone that you think I should be talking to? Um, yeah, I feel like you may have already talked to a few people that I would recommend. I was going to say Laren for sure. Him and astrophotography is amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Rach Stewart. Yep. Have you talked to her? I've yeah. spoken to her, yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um and ellen she's uh, a 
Kiwi photographer as well. She's an out, outdoor landscape photographer, um, Ellen Kayford. Okay, no, I haven't, haven't spoken to her yet, so. Would recommend. She is amazing and such a lovely human. We met at the NFT Gallery in Christchurch. I would 100% recommend her. She's the one that I talk to <laughs> doing workshops with. Nice. So yep. would recommend. All right. She's on the list. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got one more question. And uh, for many people, it's the most important one that I ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you? Um, I, I'm ambivalent. If it's there, oh. I'll eat it. If it's not there, I don't I don't order it. But you know. yep. There's something about cooked pineapple, cooked fruit for me. I'm not a big fan. Really? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love a love a bit of grilled pineapple on a uh, on a burger. You know the the Aussie yeah, works that's burger. That's so Aussie, yeah. yeah. See, I love beetroot. Beetroot on burger, yes. Sign me up. Not not yeah. a big fan of tin beetroot. But, oh really? Yeah. Uh, it. It's it's okay on a burger because it yeah. just goes by the 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 egg and the bacon and. The... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When you can't even and taste it. Else. <laughs> I used to eat just beetroot sandwiches when I was a kid. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, but yeah, pineapple and pizza—that's a no for me. <laughs> that's a big no. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll put you in the no column. In I still no haven't. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for a bit over a year, and I still haven't toted up uh, what what the numbers are. But I yeah, think yeah, you need to do a tally. Yeah, I think it's roughly 50-50. <laughs> I would say, isn't it weird? It's just split down the middle. You need to be the next question needs to be: Do you like coriander? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I I quite like coriander personally. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm a def definite fan of uh, Indian food and Thai food, and the more coriander, the better. I agree. Yep. Shove it all. My wife in. hates it. <laughs> oh no! You need to cook two separate dishes. <laughs> well, I just I just put the coriander on the side, and you know, oh, smart. Or or I just sneak the sneak it into the cooking. Yeah, just don't say anything. That's Out it. of sight, out of mind, right? <laughs> Sorry, if you can't see it, you can't taste it. Yeah, exactly. And she's like, do something different? You're like, no, no, it's the same as always. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time out to talk to me today, Krista. It's been wonderful, you know, hearing your story and uh, getting to know you a bit better. Where can people find your work? Um, people can find my work on my website, kristamay.photography or on my instagram kristamay photography um and that's where i guess my main two portfolios are fantastic i'll put links up in the uh the show notes for you as well thank you so much for having me it's been a blast and i appreciate you asking me to come on this call as well oh thanks thanks very much for agreeing to be here <laughs> no it's been amazing thank you thanks a lot Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.